Rankin, the photographer who has worked with everyone from Madonna to Tony Blair, captured the Queen's 75-year-old Golden Jubilee image. As King Charles gets ready to turn 75 himself, he called Rankin to Clarence House last month, so maybe it's starting to become a family tradition. This is where the King's birthday portrait appears, a close-up in black and white that captures him with a gleam in his eye. On Monday, in conjunction with the birthday celebration of a cause close to his heart, the Coronation Food Project, which strives to support amid the expense of the living crisis by redistributing food destined for landfills, it will be featured on the cover of the Big Issue magazine. The king, who assumed the throne much past retirement age, looks focused and resolute as he looks straight into the camera. He also has a confident smile and plenty of wrinkles. Invigorated by the prospect of becoming king, according to friends, Charles won't be making a big deal out of attaining his next milestone on Tuesday. The king is determined to make the most of his reign. Just yesterday it was announced that Charles will become the Commonwealth War Graves Commission's first patron. The Duke of Kent will also give Charles's dependable right-hand woman, Princess Anne, the position of president. Following the Coronation Food Project's birthday launch, things will resume as usual. The king is a creature of habit. He rises at 7 a.m. and begins his day with the same exercises performed by the Royal Canadian Air Force, which helped his late father stay physically fit well into his 80s. The exercise program is called 5BX, or 5 Basic Exercises. It consists of an 11-minute routine that includes running on the spot, sit-ups, back extensions, push-ups, and toe touches. Aside from a persistent backache that has plagued him for years, the king is reported to be in very good shape, a necessity considering that he frequently works 12 to 14-hour days. After that, the king has eggs, bread, and honey for breakfast. If at all possible, he avoids stopping for lunch, opting instead for a cup of tea, a sandwich, and something sweet, ideally one of his favourite Welsh cakes, at precisely five o'clock in the evening. He has a straightforward dinner of jacket potatoes or an omelette before going back to work on his paperwork late at night. An insider claims that he's surprisingly abstemious and lives quite a simple life personally. He never overeats and drinks in moderation. He also never stops being happy that despite being in his seventies, he still fits into all of his old uniforms. Charles is a music enthusiast who appreciates a wide variety of artists, including Wagner, Leonard Cohen, The Three Degrees, and even a little Bob Marley. But being outside in the fresh air, whether it be for a stroll, a garden, or laboring on his farm, digging and laying hedges, is his true pleasure. Queen Camilla is by his side throughout many of his engagements, and they both recognize that they require their own space. The two work together more than they have in the past, but they maintain distinct lives, social circles, and hobbies, what acquaintances describe as a sensible and pragmatic response to the pressures of royal life. His and her automobiles are usually waiting on the runway to whisk them off to their own country bolt holes for some well-earned downtime after returning from overseas tours, where they have frequently been living and working together around the clock. Charles will putter in his cherished gardens or on the farm, while Camilla will relish a few days with her family and friends. Additionally, it's common for them to read together while seated in different wings at Windsor Castle or Burke Hall, their estate in Scotland. According to an insider, that time apart really works for them. It may not be everyone's cup of tea. It has made them better. And what of Charles's son and successor as he mulls over his own legacy? When Prince William told reporters in Singapore this week that he wanted to go a step further than other royals by actually bringing about change instead of just highlighting worthy causes, the king undoubtedly grinned sardonically. But don't all children tell their parents how much better they could do it than they did in the past? 
chuckles a buddy. William had earlier, like Harry, been antagonistic to what he saw as his father's media spin machine. His childhood antagonism towards the king's yelling matches leaking through even the thick palace walls. William is much more understanding of his pa now that he is a father. Additionally, Charles has benefited from being in Windsor more often, especially on the weekends, by having more time to spend with his grandkids, Prince George, Princess Charlotte, and Prince Louis. Has Her Majesty erred in any of his parenting roles? Sure. Would he be willing to concede in private that there were things he could have done differently or better? Naturally, a source claims. He and the Prince of Wales are now solidly unified around a clear shared goal, which is to keep the institution in a position where it can serve the country, even though I'm sure they still disagree on everything all the time. Although this was happening regardless as the late Queen grew older, Harry's incident undoubtedly brought everything into stark contrast. His Majesty still feels great pain about the latter. I've been informed that Charles and Harry are currently communicating on barely any level. Unquestionably, the King is furious about the suffering he feels Harry brought to the late Queen during her final years, not to mention the insults Harry has directed at his own wife Camilla, who Charles is rightfully protective of. Known for his dislike of conflict, Charles will never shut the door on his younger son. Remaining true to his principles, he has dismissed Harry's requests for an apology and set the matter aside in order to focus on state business, whether his younger son has received an official invitation to his private birthday celebration on Tuesday has been the subject of much discussion this week. He hasn't, in actuality. In any case, I can disclose that the occasion is merely a small, private dinner for close friends in London. Almost no family will be there, following the King's directive, that he simply wants it to be a typical day. Both parties are deeply upset, but time is a healer. For now, it's just baby steps forward, as one knowledgeable onlooker put it. While it is very unfortunate that His Majesty will never get to see his son or grandchildren, there is no pressing need to make amends. For now, however, there will be just enough time on Tuesday before those red boxes call him again for His Majesty to hoist a glass of English sparkling wine. Organic, of course.